are going to begin the first keynote address. And I'm deeply honored to be introducing Lude Arazape, an inspirational figure for all of us and somebody to whom a very large number of feminist anthropologists, environmentalists, and generally all of us who are deeply interested in what is happening in the world today look up to, because she has been guiding us through, showing us the way in more than one direction, um, multifarious personality, a person who is deeply engaged in all the issues that are facing the globe today. We are not living in very, I would say, happy times. Today, we are living in a globe that is plagued by environmental disasters, conflicts inside, conflicts outside, a great threat to peace and harmony, a rise of many reactionary forces across the world. And this is the right time when we need to listen to Lude and to people like her. So I will first just briefly introduce her uh, as to what a great, I mean, it is amazing when you just listen to her achievements. And I think we must do that honor for her. So Lude Arizape is professor of social anthropology at the National University of Mexico, received an MA at the National School of History and Anthropology and a PhD at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has pioneered anthropological studies on migration, rural development, gender, global change, deforestation, and policy-oriented research on international development and cultural policy. She taught at Rutgers University as a Fulbright and received a John F. Guggenheim scholarship to study culture and gender in India and Bangladesh. She was director of the National Museum of Popular Cultures in Mexico. She was elected president of the National Association of Ethnologists of Mexico and secretary to the Mexican Science Academy in 1992. Professor Ariza Pei was director of the Institute of Anthropological Studies at the National University of Mexico and was elected president of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences, that is IUES, where we stand today, in 1988 and successfully organized this World Congress in Mexico in 1993. Lude Arizape became a member of the United Nations Commission on Culture and Development and soon afterwards was designated Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. She was elected President of the International Social Science Council and participated as a member of the academic faculty of the Global Economic Forum at Davos, Switzerland. The American Anthropological Association created the Lude Arizape Award in Ecology and Policy. At the United Nations Institute for Research on Social Development in Geneva, Switzerland, she was chair of the board and a member of the Committee for Development Policy at the UN, at the UN Economic and Social Council. Lude Arazape became an honorary member of the Royal Anthropological Institute of the UK and has received the order of Palme Academique from France the Award for Academic Merit of the Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Florida at Gainesville. Her most recent publications are 
Culture, International Transaction and the Anthropocene, published by Springer Macmillan in 2019, and Culture, Diversity and Heritage, Major Studies, published in 2014, also by Springer Macmillan. But I must add that I have been reading her works for several decades now. And she, I think, really did not need all this introduction because as you know, she is Ludi and she is great. So we just want to introduce her, invite her actually to give her presentation. So Ludi, the stage is yours, please. Oh, I am a bit overwhelmed by such a friendly, amiable introduction. And um, I am sometimes surprised to, to hear that introduction about myself. So let me say I'm very honored, Subhadra Chana, okay. that you have introduced me in this way. Then I would also like to thank uh, Junji Koizumi my great partner in many of the uh, events that we have had with the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. And I also thank uh, uh, Secretary General Noel Salazar for in the Executive Committee for inviting me to give this keynote speech at this uh, Congress that is being held in Yucatan, Mexico, but it is being held all around the world thanks to this extraordinary new communications technology. And my, uh, my congratulations also to my great friend, Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, who has just received an award from the UAAIS. Through these extraordinary media communications, I would like to say that it blows my mind to imagine all of you in your own countries, in your own homes, in your own offices, all around the world, listening to my speech. And I will be listening also to all of you. So this is a, a new era. We have a marked transition given this, this new way of communicating. Because the world, as Subhadra has emphasized, is going through very testing times, as the UAAS newsletter recently said. Our present situation in this speech, I would like to highlight the significance of many events that place markers on the passage of time. Although Marilyn Strathern has already warned us that we have to change our own interpretation of time in anthropological studies. But because we are living through so many transitions, I want to speak about the anthropology of transitions. Significance. It was just recently that I realized how significant it is that I am speaking to you from Tepoztlan, which is a beautiful town that many of you have read about because uh, of many anthropological studies that were carried out here. It is an iconic village, thanks to Robert Redfield's 1925 study, thanks to Oscar Lewis's 1948 study, and because of many studies by Mexican anthropologists and from uh, anthropologists from many countries that have come back to revisit Tepoztlan. And what I would like to say is that we began an ethnography here because I was confined here and we started an ethnography on the impact of COVID in Tepoztlan. And what burst out of our ethnography is the fact that Tepoztlan is no longer a little village, an agrarian town, a commercial town. It is a hub in a global network of interactive uh, networks. Significance. Yet Tepoztlan has not rejected connections. Tepoztlan was able to stop 
the contagion coming into the town for six months, and that gave them enough time to establish specific sanitary measures in all their activities, especially economic activities for tourism, hotels, uh, trade, trade ex extensions, uh, informal commercial activities. And that allowed them to control the way the contagion, the pandemic has been expanded in Tepoztlan. I will say more about this at the end of my speech. So uh, I would like to simply stress that um, the significance of the fact that it has become a hub because it has allowed the exchange with so many people from different cultures who have come to live in Tepoztlan. And I would like to uh, show you this photograph, which you can see here. It is the photograph of the hotel I am speaking from, which happens to have the best internet in town. This is why I'm here. But also because the owners of the hotel, a British uh, entrepreneur and his Mexican wife, decided to build a, a hotel in Mexico with what they invented as a Balinese Mexican uh, architecture. So you see the architecture architecture which they brought from Asia. And you can see the uh, mountains behind which everyone will recognize as being in Tepoztlan. And may I speak of an anecdote? Mr. and Mrs. Dube, S.B. Dube and Lila Dube came to Cuernavaca uh, about 20 years ago for a meeting. And I said, well, how about on Sunday we go to Tepoztlan? And they said, what? you can take us to Tepoztlan? And I said, yes, it's an hour away. <laughs> and they were so surprised. So yes, Tepoztlan is an iconic village. But I would also like to say I'm astonished to be speaking with all of you, many of whom we have worked together for 28 years since the first Congress of the UIES that took place in Mexico, the 13th Congress, which took place in 1993. And here I would like to show you a photograph of the event then. Ricardo, yes. And I would like to ask you, to what faces do you recognize? This was the plenary, the first plenary in the 13th Congress held in 1993, and you can recognize, I'm sure, Maurice Codelier, myself, uh, Carl uh, Knudsen, and Frederick Barth. And this was the very first session. So um, the significance is that the events flowing through our, our scientific discipline has also its own cultural heritage. This is my message. And we must realize this because we must also cultivate it. I will say more about this in a moment. And so in that Congress in 1993, I decided to ask some of the participants two questions. The first question was that I asked them to comment on uh, what have had what an Argentinian anthropologist had recently written then. He wrote that anthropology is a dying uh, uh, science, and we still e hear echoes of this at this time. Frederick Barth, in answering this question, said, I see rather a surfeit of theories and specialized methods in contemporary anthropology. It is far from dying, yet the strength and vitality would flourish if anthropologists directed their attention to broader matters, which would allow the development of new paradigms relevant to action as well as to academic debate. Eric Wolf, who was also here, also said, it has been said that anthropology is both an impossible and a necessary uh, science. 
And he added, he summed it up by saying, it is, an, it is necessary because it is the only discipline that studies humans in all their cultural, linguistic, and biological diversity. And this makes one flexible and attentive to the need to change ideas and methods when they don't fit in with the people we study. Also, because it is one of the last disciplines that depends on observation and allows the data we have discovered about our objects of study to change theory. I think this is key for all of us in anthropology. The next question I asked was, do you think that the 21st century will be the century of ethnic groups and minorities? Yes, in a double sense, said Frederick Barth. Firstly, because the tragedies and conflicts related to minorities and ethnic groups will continue to be given attention in the mass media. And secondly, because people's voices will increase the concern and interest in such problems in the form of culture, ethnicity, and the rights of minorities. Well, it seems to me Frederick Barth had, had a crystal ball. Um, Paul Baker, the sobering note was given by biological anthropologist Paul Baker at the time, who noted that, in fact, this is not a very brilliant question since everybody belongs somehow to an ethnic or minority group. <laughs> so, right. And Mexican archaeologist um, Jaime Litva King did play along, giving a very good answer. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and cheapen the explanation, he said, as he embarked on a detailed account of the many instances of historical atrocities that have been based on discrimination. In this picture, you can see Professor Litvak, Paul Schmidt, who was the program officer for the Congress, and myself. So he said, uh, he embarked on a detailed account of the many instances of historical atrocities that had been based on discrimination, and then said, now, if you force us to give a blunt answer, I personally believe the 21st century will be defined by the presence of plastic bottles wasted or recycled in place of glass and ceramics. <laughs> he actually said that. And he also had a crystal ball because let me tell you that one of the hot topics in the 21st century debate on the chronostratigraphy of the Anthropocene has been precisely this. What, how will the uh, stratum of our centuries be recognized? I will say more about this. And I would very quickly then go into the subject matter of our discipline and talk to you about the Anthropocene as a new response hyphen ability as Donna Haraway has called it. The 1993 IUES Congress gave the impetus to involve anthropologists in the international program entitled The Human Dimensions of Environmental Global Change and the international, with the International Council of Scientific Unions, I was able to bring IUES into this International Council of Scientific Union called ICSU at the time. And this laid a, a new grounds for the definition of the coming uh, human condition. Bonfoy and Fresov, two uh, French uh, researchers said that we are not in the peaceful and infrapolitical problematic of reconciliation of humans with nature. The Anthropocene is a political in as much as it requires arbitrating between various conflicting human forcings on the planet, between the footprints of different human groups, classes, nations, between different technological and industrial notions, and between different ways of life and consumption. He couldn't have said it better. And my purpose in, in referring to the Anthropocene is to highlight the idea that I described in my last book, that the evidence of research fully attests 
that the last 20 years are leading to fundamental changes in our view of cultural history and especially of the possible future making tasks of anthropology. Decolonization and the epistemologies of the South, as Buenaventura de Sosa has proposed, are opening up unprecedented reflective spaces. Philip de Scola has shown how the four major forms of conceiving human nature in many, in many uh, societies produce countless connections with other sentient and existing forms of life in the planet. And let me talk to you about a, an exciting new event of a book that has just came out uh, uh, by uh, David Graeber. You know David Graeber, our great anthropologist. In this book that has come out just after his death, he left us the assemblage of pieces to change the narrative of world history. With, it, with his co-author, archaeologist David Wengro, in their book entitled the dawn of everything, the, uh, a new history of humanity, they conclude, firstly, that civilization does not come as a package and that there is no evidence the top-down structures of rule are the necessary consequences of large-scale uh, change. Uh, sorry. Large-scale organization. As an example, they cite the case of the city of Teotihuacan in Mexico in the year 2000. Uh, sorry, in the year uh, 200. Significance. One of the most important contentions in their theory is what they call indigenous critique. They state that the European Enlightenment was forged through a constant exchange with colonized peoples, which, among other things, influenced emerging ideas of freedom, forcing a co-evolution of European societies and colonized people, as well as a co-production of knowledge. I agree entirely. In 2005, at the Congress of the International Development Society held in India, I presented a paper arguing precisely the same, same point. And it gives me pleasure to tell you about the scene. The scene was the very large uh, auditorium in the Ashoka Hotel in New Delhi, where I said that the genius of Western Europe had been the invention of the scientific experimental method. The audience clapped wildly. Then I went on to say that this method allowed them to process the knowledge of all other cultures of the world. Half of the audience, all from third world countries, cheered wildly. And the other half of the audience, Europeans and Americans, were mostly silent. And Cristina Amesqua, who is one of the organizers of this Congress, and I argued the same point in our 2017 point, uh, book, that it was time to recognize that the indigenous cultures and national cultures in Mexico had co-evolved in reconfiguring new intangible cultural heritage. This was a book entitled The Renovation of Intangible Cultural Heritage, Its Agents and Dynamic Processes. So, let's speak of time, historiography, and the indigenous experience. Marin and Strathern, our lighthouse holder of light, recently said that to speak more generally of Euro-American ideas about time, successive epochs perceived as interruptions in the ever-changing ever flow of events are, in effect, diverting circumstances am among new, uh, along new paths and could equally be perceived as enhanced moments of time's forward events. This is because rechanneling the course of events does not compromise that inevitable forward movement. Catastrophes do not in themselves disturb assumptions about time's flow. They inevitably involve sequences of events, 
From this point of view, such sequencing seems another version of evolutionary change, a continuity of linear movement from past to present, every temporal horizon imagined as an accumulation of non-repeatable moments. She points out that we must recall that indigenous peoples of the Americas, for whom the end of the world has already happened, and any instances of their desire for a future are expressed as a desire to go back to being indigenous again. Indeed, Strathern goes on to say, I have long had the impression that our understanding of so-called traditional societies, first studied many years ago, have been waiting for the anthropologist world to catch up. If anthropologists can grasp that for themselves, it may be a step towards grasping what their diverse interlocutors are saying. Indeed, Viveiro de Castro and Danovsky had already prefigured this idea that present day Amerindians wanting to be indigenous again are perhaps better understood as a figuration of the future, not as a remnant of the past. Strathern then adds as a postscript to her comment that anthropology has indeed found new dynamism in its attention to quite diverse apprehensions of future making. And this, I think, is our task now. Anthropology of transitions. We have to focus on, on some of these uh, transitions. And I would like to speak especially of feminist anthropology here. Broadening the agenda, research must has gone deeper into the ontology, anthropology, the practice of anthropology, the framework of historiography, cultural rights, and decolonization. In these arenas, two other trans two transitions need to be mentioned. I believe it is important to establish boundaries to describe and follow the transactions. Yes, the transactions um, that are that are uh, occurring perhaps even to describe the current and immediate uh, period as one re requiring that we recognize these anthropologies of transition. And I have lost page 13, as frequently happens. Yes. One is the transition in the roles of women by now in all realms of social and political endeavors, in demographic arrangements for gender and provider rules in families, and in technological scenarios where it is met with great resistance. Feminist anthropology has given a strong foundation for thinking about future making in this arena. In Latin America, women's lives has, have emerged as a painfully urgent priority, given that femicides continue to rise in many, many of its countries. The Economic Commission of Latin America has already declared that Latin American toxic masculinity is a major obstacle in economic and social development in the region. In recent years, however, the toxic masculinity has in many places turned into murderous masculinity. Mexico is, of course, a shameful case in point since it has one of the highest rates of femicides in the world. Women anthropologists and social scientists in the region have actively engaged in, in the topics of violence against women, as have many anthropological organizations and women's studies programs under the leadership of uh, anthropologists such as Marta Lamas, Mary Goldsmith, and many others, as well as the Colegio de Ethnologos y Anthropologos of Mexico under the leadership of Marta Patricia Castañeda. I believe that the topic it will now take a greater place in global interaction networks as women move, move to the visible forefront in global change, health, inequality, and the care economy. 200,000 of us Mexican women believe this as we poured into the central plaza of Mexico on March 8th. 
2020. This is the photograph of all of us pouring in hour after hour. And as did the women who paralyzed the economy and society in Mexico a day later on March 9, 2020, as we women all went on strike. But let us speak now of one of the themes of this Congress, which is the anthropology's intangible uh, heritage. I mention this to the extent to which anthropology has created an intellectual and uh, physical heritage that has seeped into the world imaginary. The program of this Congress very aptly focuses on the cultural strands intermingling through global connections. Here, we can stop a moment to reflect on anthropology's own cultural heritage. Today, specialists are asking how to classify, store, restore, and make use of the richness of this anthropological ethnographic heritage and objects collected all around the world. And let me tell you of my experience in UNESCO, I was invited to visit the labyrinth of basements in the American Museum of, of Natural History of the Osaka Ethnographic Museum in, in, in Japan, of the many, many rooms in uh, Pakistan that were filled with a collection of all the information, description, and videos of their traditional cultures. And it was the initiative of UNESCO that led to the emphasis in collecting all these materials. And today we ask, how can we manage this, uh, this, this kind of heritage? And just one little anecdote. When I arrived in UNESCO, a young Argentinian staff member insisted that I go to her office because I needed to see what she had in her office. I went to her office, it was filled from top to bottom, four walls of little cards, and every card had the title of a book that was assigned an ISBN number. And she said, what can, I, what can we do with this? And I said, this is a gold mine. It is a gold mine. So the very first time we were able to produce the statistics on how many translations had been made in the world, where they had been made, which countries were the ones that translated more, and, and place this uh, table of statistics in the first world culture report that was produced by UNESCO. Plus, let me tell you, cultures, cultural statistics are the most sensitive statistics in the world. It took us five long years of diplomacy to get the information about the languages spoken in every country, the national languages and the other languages. It was extremely difficult. We were able to do it. But then there were only two world cultural reports in UNESCO, and then uh, they were no, no longer published. But we have predicaments in cultural heritage. Conserving and protecting heritage has mesmerized the, world, mesmerized the world ever since it came together to save the temples of Abu Simbel in Egypt. Let me tell you that the World Heritage List is the most successful convention of the United Nations. And when at the UN World Commission of Culture and Development, we suggested 10 recommendations, the first recommendation was to create a program for volunteers to work in their summer, in their vacations, in archaeological sites the world over to save cultural heritage. And that was the most popular recommendation of all. It was very quick, quickly implemented. Safeguarding intangible cultural heritage has flourished in the Americas especially. And let me mention just two weeks ago, the fifth International Congress to Safeguard ICH, Intangible Cultural Heritage, was held in Tlaxcala in Mexico 
It was sponsored by uh, institutions of 18 countries, more than 20,000 20, participants came, attended virtually the Congress. And, uh, and they exchanged all the, the, the programs, methods, and uh, policies to safeguard uh, the, the intangible cultural heritage. And so uh, we, the, the, the uh, Congress is, is becoming more and more international with both practitioners, ma managers, uh, cultural uh, gov government, cultural officers, and the uh, civil society organizations that are safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. But it's very important now to bring up another uh, topic, protecting cultural heritage in anthropogenic cultural climate change. Climate change threats cultural heritage sites increasingly as, as it has been recognized in the, in the United States. At the, park, at the National Park Service in the United States, such, such threats were recognized in the PPS climate change response program concerns in the area have also been developed by the Society for American Archaeology's formulation of climate change strategies and many other organizations. Two authors Hamrich and Rockman warned that climate change increasingly threatening resources and, and, and sites so that managers, communities, archaeologists must take action against this reality. Yet they point out that the phenomenon is happening over such a wide range of physical and social cultural context that it is a problem too big for any one organization to tackle. Therefore, the sharing of best practices and examples between the communities must be encouraged. They also describe international science and citizen science efforts in areas of adaptation, mitigation, and communication. In moving forward, these authors give the good news that there is action on many of the priorities that identif they identify to deal with climate change threats to cultural heritage. Now, very quickly, I would like to change topic and go to digital choices, cultural heritages in video games. Debates on the role, methods, fields of study and interpretations in the world of internet have proliferated in anthropology. We all know we have read many of these. Some anthropo anthropologists are conducting projects wholly inside cyberspace. Others are using digital technologies with their informants and yet others are building deep knowledge of indigenous cultures through digital representations. Here, I will only make a few comments on a field that it seems to be has not been fully explored in anthropology. I refer to the use of cultural heritages as background, landscapes, representations, and artifacts used as weapons, dwellings, and styles of interaction in video games. It is well known that 95% of video games are deal with wars and slashing enemies with the worst possible blood spilling methods. But a few now only contextualize as far as possible both the action and the choices that one's role-playing character develops. You can tell, of course, that I, I like to play video games. I play them all the time. One of the most interesting examples is a series called Assassin's Creed Games that span history from Jerusalem to Constantinople to Rome to the Mayan cities in the Caribbean to Paris to London and to the Vikings in medieval England. And all the time they offer information, historical information of what was happening at that epoch. Another important video game with a deep philosophical background and very original gameplay in the future 
is zero dawn horizon. I would only like to call on anthropologists to delve into this new world where the reconverted mythologies of the future are being developed and being absorbed, especially by young people and children. Not to mention the extraordinary potential of using video games to teach history while developing the physical and mental skills of young players to deal with digital technologies. One aspect that has recently jolted this exciting new horizon is a game that is set in the archaeological ruins that conflate the Mayan and Peruvian pyramids with uh, their ancient symbols, apparels, and accoutrements, which confuse rather than give clarity about the historical times, forces, and characters involved. This was jarred even more by a comment by one of the native characters in Peru, a woman vendor who says to the heroine of the video game, we don't like archeologists because they take away things, implying that the military-like invaders that are cutting down the trees uh, and, and bringing industry, they do bring money to the region. So I think, at the very least, anthropologists must be made aware that there is a new cultural world brewing in the video games that we must give attention to. What can be done with a vast exploding new creative zone in terms of anthropological research and advocacy? This is one of the questions I leave with you for this Congress. And finally, just a few words pertaining to the theme of the uh, Congress related to a research project on COVID-19 in Tepoztlan, which I will just skim through because we are presenting it in one of the panels. Tepoztlan was known in literature for the strength and the resilience of their community efforts to define their own uh, development for the future. You see here a mural. The Postland is full of these murals, uh, murals made by young people, but also by young international painters who love to come to the Postland and fill the walls with murals. And in this mural, perhaps you can see, it says no to the golf club because they stopped a huge prog program to develop a region that would have absorbed most of the water in the region. And then further down, it says, Tepoztlan no se vende. Tepoztlan is not for sale. And you see a warrior, an Aztec warrior, dressed uh, with the accoutrements of, of the time. And Below it says, se van, se van, se van de Tepoztlan, los usurpadores de la tierra. They're leaving, they're leaving, the usurpers of our lands are leaving. So you can see the strength of the Postecos when they decide they don't want something. And it was very interesting that when the pandemic began and it started spreading into all the towns, Tepoztlan was the only town in the region where, especially with the strength of women, the vigor of, of older women, they said, we close down the town, nobody comes in. And for during six months, they stopped people. Of course, the, the people who came for, uh, lived in Tepoztlan or us residents, we were uh, given a special permit to go in and out of the town. This took place until September, when uh, at that time, the local government was able to have assemblies where they decided exactly how they were going to do the opening. So they created uh, certain rules that uh, hotels, tradespeople, markets, uh, people in economic activities had to abide by. And with that, they were able to control to a greater extent the contagion of 
the, the epidemic. But then, of course, came December, the fiestas, and, and you could see the graph going up. But as I say, we're going to pre present this uh, in one of the panels, so I will not say any more. Just to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic has hurled every person it has touched into a yet unmapped, unknown world of possibility and of possible global connections. This is what we will debate in the Congress by reconfiguring these global networks of heritage significance. So allow me to close this address by recalling the conclusions I drew in my 2019 book, which I call my anthropological testament. <laughs> I spent five years analyzing my ethnographic notes on all the international meetings about culture I had attended since the 80s. And I arrived at these conclusions that in studying heritages, cultures, and global connections, anthropology must go beyond the passive defense of life towards a proactive agenda of living and transformation. In terms of our vision of human evolution, the historical interpretation of Homo Faber must also give greater attention to the production of human beings through care, through training, through protection in their early years, so that they can be become full human members of uh, our societies. And it has to give greater attention to the co-production of knowledge. All knowledge is always co-produced. And the activation of exchange systems with other groups, and importantly, the self-transformation of every individual and every cultural group. It is not enough to sustain. We must transform. This goes beyond the world of extractivism and neoliberalism. Ultimately, the goal of transformation must be to protect people's capabilities to find direct solutions to their living conditions through their freedom to create. Thank you very much. Canvas that you have spread before us, opening up such a vast discursive space where you have brought in so many issues from environment to culture to feminism to digital technology to the production of knowledge and very importantly, the future to which we can look and we can hope for. So uh, are we to take some questions? Can we take some questions? Yes. So the, I mean, somebody has to open up the, I mean, it has to be technologically open, Ricardo. So should we go ahead? Any questions from the audience? I think Ricardo has to, facilitate that. Ricardo? Is there any possibility of taking questions, Ricardo? He says it's a little difficult. No. Okay. okay. So Ricardo says no questions are visible. So Lude, yes. we have to wish you, I don't know, it's good night here. Yeah. Good afternoon to you. Yes, it's uh, early morning here early morning there. So please ask the public to write them on the chat. 
Just let me try. So Heather has a question for you, Lode. What a phenomenal talk, of course. What would you say about the future of ecofeminism, feminist political ecology, and gendered environmental labor? I think, Heather, that's another talk. <laughs> It would be it would be a would a, be a seminar, a long absolutely, afternoon. Absolutely. But I wish I could. Yes, but I wish I could spend physically ahead, with right? you. But let me say that it's important to realize that we have already a, an intellectual heritage of, of feminist anthropology, where the first era was uh, they talked a lot about ecofeminism, which is still valid and going on that we now have to perhaps take a step forward with the political ecology of feminists, which I like very much because it takes into, into account the larger world of economics and politics and gendered environmental labor. There, uh, we have to be much more precise on exactly what is the impact of the many initiatives that women have taken about the environment, because at the level of barrios, you know, neighborhoods, communities, cities, it's women who, are, who, the, who, who organize in first instance because they are worried about water, about sanitation in their homes, about having electricity, about uh, in the big cities, about the traffic and, and about having jobs that are uh, well remunerated and, and recognized. And, and have a balance in the labor of men and women in all areas uh, of, of social life. This is what I would say as a telegram. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Lude. Any other questions? So we can conclude. So thank you very much. To all the participants. Oh, there's Gladhill. Oh, Hello, there's John. <laughs> Hello, John Gladhill, my great Hello, friend. John. Nice to see you after a long time. Yes, I'm so glad you were able to, to be here with us. Wonderful talk, Lourdes. Thank you. What do we conclude from the exclusion of indigenous voices in yeah, COP26? Un abrazo, otro abrazo, John. Yes, well, the thing is, I have always advocated that indigenous visions of the environment have, in many instances, a better base, a better intellectual, conceptual, social basis for policies to the future. However, the uh, political apparatus and the institutional assemblage that has to uh, be built for international uh, congresses, for international agreements, I know by experience is huge. Within that, it is difficult to insert the claims and demands that do not fit into the big edifice of what is being constructed. So I'm not sure exactly how we could solve this, whether get more indigenous people within the, the institutional structures to discuss uh, the environment at the global level, which means having the power to be there, because as we know, it all has to do with power. Or whether we anthropologists should, should insist demonstrating how uh, indigenous communities have a better vision of how to relate to the environment. I think this second one is very useful. Uh, like in Mexico, we have a very good anthropologist called Ekar Berge, who has shown that indigenous communities in Mexico could be laboratories for many of the things that we need to could continue to develop the environment sustainably. So I think we have, it would have to be on, the, on both sides. 
give more power to indigenous organizations and at the same time demonstrate that they what they are proposing is extremely important. What Bolivia and Ecuador have done of giving rights to nature is extraordinary and should be better known. La, La Pachamama, the policy of respecting Earth, I think should be brought to every single international meeting. So this is what I would say. Thank you for your question. Rosa Boswell, can you tell us about the persistence of background landscapes in unequal societies and their continuation of heritage inequalities in the present? Yes, well, as we know, it takes a long time to change culture. It takes a long time, but it can be done. I think there is no child, young person, uh, adult person today that is not aware of the questions of the, about the environment. However, I think we are still failing at giving very precise, practical solutions so that people can engage in them. There is a gap between what people can do at the uh, level of their daily lives, uh, take care of water, uh, take care of, of the whole metabolism, industrial metabolism, and what needs to be done at the level, at national level and international level. That gap, I think we anthropologists have the information, but we have to sit down and produce a new series of practical steps to carry, to use this for policy. It will come, but we just have to accelerate this. So, um, thank you. Felipe, hello Felipe, how are you? Could we say that neoliberalism management of diversity is responsible for incorporating heritage and tradition in market products? How this capitalization contributes to patrimony and populations? Yes, we have seen in the last, uh, I would say, 50, 60 years that uh, many companies have realized the usefulness of indigenous knowledge and the, uh, diversity for their own purposes of expanding their, their uh, enterprises to deepen capitalism. Uh, and this can be very deleterious and must be managed in a different way. This wave of extractivism that we have had for the last 20 years is really terrible because it takes away the resources in many uh, regions that are needed to implement better practices related to the environment. In Mexico, Mexico is a case in point. We have one of the highest rates of murder of uh, local people, community people, indigenous people who defend their resources. This is terrible because it means that because of liberalism, the state agrees with these companies that simply come to our countries and extract and produce disasters and leave disasters, which we will have to take up in the, in the uh, further uh, further on. Now, there is one advantage of the fact that these companies that have the economic power and that have the laboratories to analyze, that they produce a knowledge that is sometimes very useful to use some of these uh, products for medicines, for example. And I remember I used to run into many prospectors from the pharmaceutical companies in the indigenous communities in Mexico. And we knew that they were taking samples to their laboratories, which they would then use to make medicines that they would sell back to us. And I know India has, has had a very important fight against such practices when the Neem plant yes. uh, was patented. Right. 
and also the rice, lot of them. Tell yes. Me. So what we must do is this practice, a scientific practice of finding out exactly what are the best uh, resources in a given plant or in a given practice or th therapy, even therapy. That's useful, but we must make sure that it is useful. Yes, they may make some medicines, but they must give back that co-production co of knowledge to the community, to the society, and to the country, so that the whole country and all these groups can develop together. Maxi Spiegel. Hello, Maxi. Along with John's question, what about the large presence of oil industry representatives at COP26? Well, it's very clear now, very clear that the greatest obstacle for sustainable policies, sustainable environmental policies, have been the oil companies, and especially ESO and Chevron. And everywhere they had they have financed activities which are anti-ecology and have confused the issues and what is very sad is that they continue to do so because they are so powerful now this has to do with power structures that must realize they are destroying the world so that if we continue like this there's no point in getting in taking fossil fuels out of the earth anymore if you are creating cities and countries that are being destroyed, especially in terms of health, in terms of pollution, of pandemics that are now everywhere and, uh, and that also thrive in, su in such an environment. So I think something must be found to stop these companies. And very slowly, very slowly at least, some American universities now have stopped financing these oil companies. It's, it's really extraordinary that these universities still financed these oil companies. And then if some countries need to use oil for revenues, they must find, quickly find alternatives, renewable energies. But this must come, as we can see, not, it will not come from governments. It has to come from huge mobilizations as the young people are doing. It's admirable what young people, Greta Thunberg and all these contingents of young people are doing. They are placing this challenge at the highest international level and COP26 has made it very clear. But we must continue this pressure until this is stopped. Well, the young people are fighting for their own lives. Yes, yes. Rosa Boswell, mm -hmm. uh, Rodrigo, interesting talk. Thank you very much. Do you think that institutions like UNESCO are considering these new global trends in their work? Oh, yes, I know. I know for sure that they are but they are also democratic institutions. Let's not forget that the United Nations and UNESCO are two institutions that have assemblies where all countries vote. And I know how difficult it is to get them to agree in taking certain decisions. But if I compare my experience in 1995, in UNESCO and what UNESCO is doing now, I can see <clears throat> that there has been great progress in the way policies are being put forth, except every step on the way has to be negotiated. But it is really the pressure of citizens, the pressure of active environmental activists, the pressure of women's movements, the feminist movements that will slowly be able to force their governments to take better decisions in these institutions because the institutions have to respond to their governments they are state parties to all the programs 
So we must help UNESCO to do better uh, in these terms. And slowly, slowly, it will become better. So I'm sure they are considering. <clears throat> what is very important to realize is that there are countries that are against UNESCO and against the United Nations. Why? Because they give a global view. They have a global view and they are committed to peace and to development. And this is why we have to defend them. Thank so. you. Thank you, Lode. I think I'm getting the message that we have to wind up. We had okay. a wonderful discussion. Maybe there are many more questions, but they have to find some other forum. Maybe you can write to them. Uh, we should be Certainly. in communication. Be glad to. Yes. Thank you, Lode. Thank you once again. And thanks to the audience and to the organizers for this wonderful show. Thank you. Thank all of you, all of you from Mexico, all around the world. Bye-bye. Bravo to you. Bye.